Hello, YouTube viewers. Welcome to my channel, Science to Technology. In today's show, Rocket Monday, we're going to talk about Boeing Starliner stuck on 2024 0809. So, this is when the video is being made. So, what exactly happened? Well, you have to understand there is a whole lot of mess, so we have to understand some context. Uh, second NASA commercial crew program player. There are two players. One is Boeing that was started in the race in 2014. They got around 4.2 billion dollar and in 2014 SpaceX got uh, the same contract for 2.6 billion dollar. Now you may be like okay why there are two contractors? Well the reality is NASA has learned from the mistake of space shuttle that if shuttle ever was grounded the, the end the end they no longer had wings so they learned it the hard way that under no circumstances you should have only one system you must have a country like usa must have dual redundant system meaning two completely different pipelines should be there one could be expensive one could be uh, you know slower does not matter but they must have two system so uh, that's why two contracts were there now that's another reason why boeing keeps getting money even though they are like missing all the deadlines and all that jazz uh, okay, so that's how we got Boeing situation. Now, first crew launch supposed to happen in 2017. Uh, and this is, uh, we are talking about now, 2024, seven years later. So let's understand some timeline. In December 2019, they did their first launch. Everything is good. It's just uh, software was just like, peace, I'm out. And at that point, they did not manage to dock with ISS. So that was a waste. And then they had to do again on May 2022. And this time they had the luxury of successfully docking. So, okay, fine, good. Now they did a recent launch, which had like actual crew on board. Now compare this to Dragon, you have to understand they were almost on the same track. They also launched in March 2019, uh, That, but thankfully they did not have software issue. They did proper docking, they went, they docked, uh, and then they launched again for May 2020, uh, and this was the first crew. That was the intent of it. The idea was very simple. You launch first, that is completely uncrew. Then you launch in half crew, meaning instead of four people, you only send two people, and then it's like completely normal. So that's the intent of it. Uh, again, Boeing has to go through the extra round because again, first time they failed. Second time, uh, it did work. Third time, they got stuck. So yeah, I, I could uh, I could easily see they may require one extra launch before people are actually trusted. But let's see. So this is the Starliner saga. So let's understand the launch event. Launch event happened on 5 June 2024 and Starliner was successfully launched, meaning the rocket puppy did its job. There is no problem there. However, the docking happened on 6 June 2024. You're like, okay, that's a bit late. Well, the reality was this time it shows up an issue, meaning while they were going there, uh, the thrusters were like, yeet, I'm out of there. Uh, meaning there are dog houses, so to say, and they have total of 28 uh, thrusters. Now, in that 28 thrusters, uh, they are generally made in packs. One whole pack glitched out, meaning it's like, peace, I'm out. So they had to stop that mission and they tried to reboot the system, do everything they need to, troubleshooting basically. And <coughs> while everything uh, came back, out of five that went out, only four came back up, meaning one was permanently poofed. So they docked it. Now be mindful, all these thrusters we are talking about, they are in the uh, service module, not on the capsule, meaning if they return this, the capsule would uh, be completely intact, people inside it would be completely intact, but uh, the service module would be lost to atmosphere, it will turn to dust. So that reason, NASA and Boeing, both of them realized it would be a really good opportunity to test everything in space while you have the hardware rather than just like reconstructing it. You have the hardware, let's test it out. So they did that. Service module was docked. So they are like, okay, let's do everything. Uh, they simulated everything they could simulate. They did hot firing, everything they did. Now, problem was figured out like, okay, we have one thruster failed, this thruster failed. Okay, cool, awesome. Why? And that answer, why was not uh, what we classify as solved adequately, meaning we, they do know, but it's not good enough answer, meaning it's not like, okay, this happened, this exactly happened, and this is how we can guarantee this will not happen again. Yeah, that was not there. So these two people got stuck in limbo. So that's why the delay was there. So the moment they detected a problem, a new pro program was created. It's like, okay, let's dock it longer in space so we can be damn sure that we have uh, exhausted all the testing data. We can get as out of it and then we're going to detach because again, it's going to burn up. It's rather to get the details out of it rather than burn up. Unfortunately then for them, because uh, I do not know how the heck that happened, but did happen. It's like they had to had a briefcase with extra clothes and uh, that was taken out the last minute. Really poor timing. So this was the launch event. 
Now, whose fault it is? Well, reality is something went wrong and it's causing overheating. Now, here's the deal. Uh, why overheating is such a big issue? Well, first you are talking about things that can uh, be few seconds away from going boom next to human. So there is like, okay, it should not have random overheating. Like you have overheating, you should have compensation for that. If it's overheating in a place where it's not supposed to overheat, why the heck it's overheating? So that's a very serious issue. Now, what did that cause? Okay, you had overheating issue. What did it cause? It caused Teflon O-ring failure so to say this is last night's uh, live stream where nasa te did a telecommunication where it's like okay this is what we think of as of now and uh, what that te failed teflon green is causing is flow uh, restriction meaning the flow is not working as it's supposed to so is uh, messing up and again computer program is shutting it down because that's what it's supposed to do so we figured it out that overheating is causing a teflon failure that teflon failure is causing a hull failure which is causing a thrusters failure okay cool that's sorted we still have no idea why the heck there is overheating in the first place that's the problem now how do we know this well uh, nasa generally keeps a test article completely copy paste of what they are actually putting in space for example if they ever have to send a command to a mars rover they don't send directly command to the mars rover they will always send the command to a dummy that is not even a dummy at that point it's actually full fledged copy paste of uh, what they have in the space they will send it run the command so any obvious work uh, screams out of them and then they're gonna send the same thing in white sands new mexico they have a test article of this puppy and this is the service module and they are testing it the rock, uh, thruster pod they are testing it there now in that they are trying to figure out what have happened and that's how we know that teflon o-ring failure because again it's in space so who is going there and checking it we are checking it here so uh, they ran all the simulation they retry to replicate the issue and that's how we found out that's what's happening okay cool so all the mission is still going on be mindful the testing as i'm recording this video is still going on and i'm reasonably sure it will be going on for much longer is they are trying to do what we call rca root call analysis what the hell caused that it's like if it, if this place is supposed to overheat, why the heck we did not put a thermal mitigation, basically a shielding, thermal reflector, whatever have you, or if it's not supposed to overheat, why the heck it heat? So they are doing that root cause analysis. That part is the weak link. We figured out what went wrong. It's just that why it went wrong and uh, risk of manually piloting. Now, this is another gotcha. You may be like, okay, we had orbital test mission two. Everything was fine. It was completely automated. So why the heck we can't just like eat it out of there? Well, uh, here's the deal. If uh, pilots sit inside it and then they move around the thrusters and all that, there is a risk it might fire the defective one and it could cause what we call class cascade failure, meaning one fault in one system could cause a backfeed and blow up other systems, which would be bad. Let that be very clear. If that would ever happen, it would be bad. Now, it's a risky thing. It's not like, okay, I say if human does human input, it goes boom. That is not guaranteed. It's just very simple where you are. It's not, it's not a risk that people are comfortable taking. So that's why the my, uh, manual piloting was yeeted out of there. And then it created another issue. If you do not have manual piloting, you cannot do autopiloting. It's like, okay, why? Well, the software base, basically, think of this as the code stack, which was messed up. That's why they failed in the first time. Uh, they rebuilt it. And this was OFT2. Now, OFT2's code stack was incomplete, apparently. It's not supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be complete package, where it's like manual input or autonomous system. So they should not have, like, basically, it's thinking this way. Your plane has a button that's like, press it to start autopilot, press it again to shut off autopilot. And again, almost anything that has that has a way to turn it on and off. Here, they did not had a manual mode. They only had software for autonomous, so they tested the code, everything is fine. But once they tampered with the code, now they had like a new code that is OFT2 uh, manual edition, and they tested the code. Okay, good, awesome. But here's the they never tested the damn thing without a manual input, meaning they no longer can guarantee that software will not get stuck in a loop. And when you hear uh, people talk about like it will take a few weeks and it's a non-trivial thing, it's not trivial as in like in, it's a hard thing to do. It's triv it's very complex in order to test the damn thing. You cannot have like, oh, pilot inputted this stick and it blew up. That cannot happen. For that reason, that's why the software part is so um, messy. The, that's why NASA will always talk. We have mission load different. It's like OFT was the mess up. This, and again, this calls uh, NASA into questioning. It's like, why did you launch a crew capsule with a crew inside with an incomplete software package? It's a button. It's a automatic manual. Big red button, big green button. The end. Now, I know it's not a button, but you get the point. Like, it's not supposed to be like that. It's like, hey, because here's the deal. There is a reason why you want a manually piloted craft 
to have the ability to autom uh, autonomously land simply because pilot could be knocked out by other things like be it g forces be it uh, hypoxiation there are hundreds of reasons why person could be knocked out so you always want to make sure that your system can handle itself it's by design requirement it's by design in crew it's by design in soyuz also so this idea of like uh, let's just like you know clutch together a software package that is incomplete test it and then launch it okay it works good enough now upgrade the package we'll never have to actually test it the first testing they are doing is like oops so that's why they cannot trust the autonomous package yet basically if software is there code uh, line codes are there i'm reasonably sure of it it's just that uh, who is going to take this one and this is the first time boeing is like yeah don't do it so i'm pretty sure they never tested it so that full auto mode lack of full auto mode is just like you should not have that so there is some serious fault let that be very clear something seriously wrong happened now there are some conflicts here that's why we do not have definitive answer the conflict is uh, at this point in time when i'm making this video everything is fine nobody is in danger okay let that be very clear it was like they're stranded they're starving no no nobody is in danger everything is fine so what does that mean? That simply means ISS has backup. And this is the primary reason why whenever you have a new cap capsule testing mission, they only send two people. They are designed in that way. The mission profile is designed in that way. And uh, they have backups. So what does that mean? That simply means they are these two gentlemen, they are in a position of what we call not a great or not terrible. Simply because they lost their briefcase, they no longer have enough clothes. And I'm actually shocked that we still do not have a zero G washing machines. Yeah, all the clothes, they are one, one use. So yeah, that cloth part sucks for them. That part like, yeah, that's not good. Until the next resupply, not a good. So that part is like, they are basically not having the best time, but they're like, we're gonna survive, you know? They, they, they can live, they can live. They're not in danger, they're not in harm. The food, water, all of that, they're good, they're sorted. Now, if Starliner uh, returns and uh, basically, astronauts are inside it, there is 90% probability nothing bad will happen. So like, okay, then why don't we do that? It's like 90% is not acceptable, especially after two incidents known as space shuttles. It's not acceptable. You have to give 99.999, basically. I think it's a 99.669s. You need that kind of system. Basically, the percentage of it working just well enough, it's not good enough. Basically, it's reaching an uncomfortable territory. And you are talking about two astronauts, that's no longer acceptable because most of the space industry realize that you can oops whatever you want to oops. You can boom a rocket, you can uh, destroy a payload, nobody gives a damn. But you cannot oops a human. So, da shall not oops a human. For that reason, this percentage is like, no, red alert, stop everything. Okay, they did that. Now, okay, then why don't we have an absolute decision? This is what we're going to do. Well, the reality is NASA people, basically a group of people. Some people would be expert in uh, thrusters. Some people would be expert in the trajectory. Some people would be expert in helium leaks. So all these people, uh, they are looking at it and they're giving it different odds. And that's a messy situation. That should not happen. Ideally, if uh, NASA is like, okay, thrusters, what's the odd? They will say one in 50. Uh, okay, heat shield, what is the odds? One in 50. Okay, uh, computation, flight directors, is like, what is the odds? One in 50. If everybody's one in 50, okay it's one in 50 we are cancelling it it's supposed to be one in 250 if i'm not mistaken so that odd is not lining up boeing is like bro it's one in 300 chance we good we sorted let's go and other people in nasa also they're like dude we good like these things are designed in that way they can have proper failure outright in one uh, thruster column or even multiple thrusters and they can still work they're designed in that way but uh, we are basically not taking chances we are basically being too cautious at this point in time but being too cautious is one of those things where it's like it has opportunity cost but if that if is way too painful so it's a messy situation because nobody in nasa can just agree on the what are the odds we do not know what decision is going to take now assume worst case scenario this is uh, like you know not safe for human return okay what can they do they can detach it it will slowly fall off like wait a minute uh, wouldn't it crash back again no they are designed in such a way passive fail safe orbits meaning once that jettison is and be mindful iss has its own thrusters from soyuz systems it can move out of the way so if there is any probability that it can hit back in the other orbit it can move out of way that's not an issue they are designed in that way that's why i'm saying like these systems are designed for multiple layers of failure you're not supposed to rely on them but it's like oh let's say you're it's trying to do re-entry one thruster fail it should not like boom it's like i got this so it does have more than enough where it can be safely jettisoned without any issue it's not iss in danger it's like minor inconvenience or slow push off at worst 
So they go, I'm doing one for you. You have Canada arm. They can just unlock it and push it downwards if they are like really naughty. They don't need to. It's just they can do that. They are designed in that way. So uh, that odds are not matching. Huh? Assuming that's what they have to do. They have to eat this puppy and they will be stuck in ISS for longer. What can they do? Well, uh, the second mission, that is Crew 9 mission from SpaceX Dragon capsule, that will only carry two astronauts rather than four astronauts and they will return. Unfortunately, uh, how the dossiers are arranged, uh, they will take a bit longer. How long? February 2025. This is at the time of making the video. Be mindful. I hope by the time you're watching it, they figured it out and they're like, okay, let's just put them back, return it. Everybody's safe. It was like we were over cautious. We figured a lot of things out. Everybody's happy. Everybody's good. But uh, I do not know. So they have to stay a bit longer. Really ugly clothes they have to wear for very, very, very long time. So what can we expect in the future? Well, uh, reality is everybody messed up, everybody effed up. There is no uh, better way of putting it. It's like a chain of command failed because here still, there are three main players here, uh, Boeing, NASA, and Rocketdyne, uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne. Now like why Aerojet Rocketdyne? They are the puppy who made the RCS thruster. Now, Boeing has this sort of uh, dodging responsibility when their air crashed investigation where they're like no no our subcontractor messed it up it does not matter like for example if i buy a dell laptop and the intel messes up i'm not gonna contact intel i'm gonna contact dell because i paid money to dell and i paid for dell i got warranty from dell so same thing goes with boeing no when airlines buy a boeing aircraft they want boeing stamp let me be very clear rockets and aircrafts they are cheap like in terms of the hardware, in terms of things that go into it, that's not expensive. They're like, wait a minute, then why they are so millions and millions and billions of dollars? Yeah, it's the stamp. It's the quality control stamp. It's people working their ass off to be damn sure that I give this a stamp that uh, 99. Triple, uh, you know, triple nine, it will not have an issue. Somebody giving, I give you guarantee of 99.99s where it won't have an issue. That guarantee, basically, so damn sure where investigation, insurance, they can be damn sure. That's why it's so expensive. It's that stamp. You can see, compare how quickly uh, SpaceX is willing to just like make a rocket and blow it up. Because again, they do not need to worry about it. But once they do human testing, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's be gentle here. Let's be damn thorough. That thoroughness cost money. So NASA did not pay rocket dime. NASA paid Boeing. It's like Boeing, here's money. Give me your best stuff. And Boeing is like, oh no, our subcontractor messed it up. It's like, that does not matter. It's your quality control that we are paying for. You should be able to catch it. So assuming uh, Ro rocket dime messed it up, Boeing should have caught it. Boeing should have been like, whoa, 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 man. They, of course, it would have caused delay and it would have caused friction, but it would have been better than being stuck. So. Uh, Boeing, you say, should have caught it. Another aspect is how did this software mess up actually crossed uh, NASA's management? That's like a not acceptable kind of thing. Whereas, like, you are telling me that you launched a system that has this sort of game, game baking stuff, where it's like, oh no, no, it's the mission payload is like, you know, the software. And I'm like, you are actually telling me for some reason, if there is something bad happening and people are passing out, they cannot just press a button. It's like, okay, just do emergency auto save. Are you serious? Are you serious in 2024? So let this be very clear. The chain of command, basically everybody messed up somewhere. So that happened. So what can we expect? At this point in time, there is sunken cost fallacy. And it again, it reflects badly on NASA. Because again, astronaut did not bought from Boeing. They bought from NASA. So NASA's quality assurance team would have been like, yeah, we messed up. We actually launched you on a system that did not have a complete software testing. And be mindful, the software on this puppy is like a nightmare. So yeah. And again, software is not the right term. The right term would be firmware. So the firmware is messed up. So. You see, everybody in the supply chain was like, whoa, 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 whoa. So this is bad. Now, would this project be canceled? No, most likely not. Now, there is a tiny probability that Boeing might cancel it simply because they are hemorrhaging money at this point in time and they cannot afford this losing money because again, they are losing billions of dollars for this uh, project. And uh, there is only a few years left. Uh, 2025, maybe they can do one launch in 2025, maybe two launches after that, but by 2030, ISS would be retired. So there is not enough uh, room left and uh, they no longer even have rocket. And if it's already burnt billions over budget, that creates a scenario where it's like, dude, you can't sell it for a high price. Why? Because Dragon is there. And uh, Sierra Nevada is also working their ass off to make their craft. So it's not economically viable. So they can cancel it on their end, whereas like, sorry, we cannot support it anymore. So that 
could happen likelihood is low because again that would be a very big reputation hit like and boeing only has a reputation left at this point in time otherwise anybody who knows the company is like yeah peace i'm out so that creates an issue so sunken force fallacy is there another aspect is national security and yes i do understand and do respect that u.s government is like da shall always have two craft even though one is expensive, one is cheaper, one is better, one should always have to craft. Because be mindful, just a few weeks ago, we realized the first stage two of Falcon 9 going boom. And be mindful, that's after 300 launches. It even sounds wrong saying 300 launches, but it did happen, right? Think about something like you had a fault in a design that never uh, blew up in 300 times. And then it's just like, yeet, today is my day. So that's why you must have a dual redundant system. Again, nobody even backs up hard drives in one hard drive. They're always like two or three. So I get it. So at this point in time, this project will be safe. It will survive of hope, but uh, it's on thin ice, so to say. Thin ice, very, very thin ice. So this was my presentation on Rocket Monday and uh, what the hell is going on with Boeing Starliner. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press this like. Press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.